That's what you now, don't I? This is the Black Rifle Coffee Podcast. Prepare to get caffeinated. All right. Welcome to another episode of Free Range American. Have someone I've been trying to hunt down for quite a few years, actually. Uh, Mr. Dan Schilling. Thanks for having me, JT. Welcome. Good to be here. Combat controller. Yep. We'll get into that. Your son has worked for us for a long time. Uh, yeah, actually, he's been with you guys for a while. Does yeah. your coding. He's a back-end guy, and he runs a lot of that stuff. He he's loves working there. Built a, a few of the sets, done a lot of yeah. uh, engineering yeah. when it comes to audio and 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 kind of wiring podcasts and stuff like that. And he's worked for some of your other indictable uh, convicts like Jeff Kirkham and <laughs> doing stuff like that for, you know, Ready Man and some of those other places that it all swirls around each other in my experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's let's kick it off right in the beginning. When when did you come in the Air Force and why did you pick the Air Force? Let's, let's let's start there. I picked the Air Force because I was stupid. And the reason I was stupid <laughs> was I joined the Army first. So I was a paratrooper grunt. Most people don't know that that's how I started my career, humping a 60 in a ruck. And uh, I dug it. Like I was in a Pathfinder platoon. It was cool. But what, I went, what unit? Uh, it was a, a 79th Infantry. It was a Pathfinder platoon. Oh, okay. And, um, but I went TDY with some combat controllers. And this was in the 80s. I'd never seen night vision goggles. They were landing blackout planes from the 8th SOS out in the mountains. And they were talking about, hey, we're Halo and Scuba. I'm like, what the hell are you guys? <laughs> And, he's, and this guy, Pete Neal, he's dead now, but he's who got me into combat control. He's like, well, we get Halo pay, Scuba pay, and we get Pro pay. I was like, Pro pay? I'm a corporal in the Army. I'm like, what is Pro pay? And he said, that's cool guy pay. And I went, I'm in. I want Halo Scuba, and I, I want need, cool guy pay. I need, cool I need to guy be that pay. guy. I need to be paid for being cool. And so um, <laughs> I actually ended up getting out of the Army and got into the Air Force, and then the rest is history. I became a combat controller and uh, loved my job. You know, what was, what was the process like then? You doing a branch transfer like did you have drug to deal exit the army or did they let you so what i did was uh i was in the army army contract i went and found an air force recruiter and i talked to him about combat control and this is at the time you couldn't even enlist for combat control because yeah, like, here's yeah. how you get in to the air force same thing when i came in you still couldn't get a contract no, for these things no, it you was just had like to try out yeah. and then if you didn't make it you're going to be a cook or something else and uh, or molons whatever the air force needs and uh so he gave me all the paperwork he's like if you can get this release signed I can get you in the Air Force. So I went back to my company commander and I'm like, hey, sir, like I want to get in the Air Force and da 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 da. And he's like, well, I'll tell you what. And I was a pretty high performing guy there. And he's like, if you can get the Air Force to accept you, I'll let you go. I went, funny you should say that, sir. And he was boxed in. He signed it <laughs> to his credit. And uh, I got out of the Army and in the Air Force. Now, that would never happen in these days either. <laughs> but that's how I, so I just sort of hoodwinked the army and got out. And, uh, but funny enough, I ended up back in the army at one point. I did, I was in the 19th group, which is where I met Evan and Jeff what? Kirkham. Like Ow. we were in the SF together. We got to get, we'll get to that. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, so yeah, what you, do, you, do they make you go to basic training again or did you get to skip No, that? I skipped basic. Okay. I went straight to the OLH, the in-doc course. So uh, back 150 other guys. Was there just one in-doc then or was it PJ and I was in the very control? first PJ CCT in-doc course. Okay, so it was a combined. It was the first one we ever combined. Okay. And we started with 150 some guys and my class at the in-doc graduated 15. And then my when I graduated all of the pipeline, there was six of us left from my original oh. class. Like now, 4% success rate. Did you do any preparing at all? Did you have any experience in the water? Or, or did you go into this blind like, eh, I'll learn it? I went in blind in, with the sense that I didn't understand everything that was going to be required. But I don't think anybody does. doesn't matter if you're SEAL, Green Beret, TAC-P Ranger. doesn't matter. You don't really know, right? So you That's how I feel now. Like, I feel like... Like, cause I have so many kids that hit hit me up on Instagram and things like that. What's 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 the tech school like? What's this like? What's this like? I didn't have that option back then. No. And going in blind was I felt better. You had no clue. You're like, well, what? and I think the approach then, I think for guys like us, when you do that, is I will do whatever they tell me until they kill me. That's the only way they can stop me. Or if I snap my leg, then I have to stop. But otherwise, that was my approach. And I grew up, I was born in Newport Beach. I surfed as a kid, you know, like that, the ocean was my friend. And so swimming was kind of a thing for me. But, you know, 
crossovers, not not crossovers, yeah. underwaters, you know, <laughs> bobbing, drown proofing. Those were not things that you did in Newport Beach, California. But uh, so there's, I don't think there's any prep for that. And now we do a really good job, I think, of helping young men and maybe women that are going to start this process to be able to get into it. And it, it's good for us as a community because we're, we're, we're dropping the attrition rate now. Yeah. And that's really important. Well, I wouldn't, I don't know. I think that's, you got to unpack that a little bit because when we say we're dropping the attrition rate down, we're, you know, now the Air Force Special Warfare Program has AFSW prep, which is eight weeks long. We are, yeah. we are not only recruiting right now, but we are preparing right. So right. we're That's not, the we're not a treating, you know, less. We are, we are just making sure the ones that come in, we have found, yeah. we have found the things that, that we need to look for psychologically, physically, and mentally that'll, that'll, that'll breed success. That'll, that'll actually pass. That's right. And that's actually part of the purpose of my last book, you know, alone at dawn, everyone thinks it's about John Chapman and combat control. And it is in a very real sense. It's this parallel arc of those two stories. And I started when John was born, which is, you know, 15, 13 years after combat control started. And I stopped the book in 2002 when he died, but it extends past that. The fact is, for me, the purpose of that book was to change the public's view of the U.S. Air Force. And I compare, and this will make sense to you because you, this is what you do for a living every day is you, you make visual media to impact people's lives. And what I always equate it to is for us in combat control, who no one ever knew about. It's just the way it is. It's, tech key, it's even worse. Yeah, yeah. It's Transformers did us one favor, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> and it's, maybe. But, um, you know, my goal here is to change the public's view of what the Air Force is. And here's the analogy. U.S. Navy SEALs, the movie with Charlie Sheen and Michael Bain, 1990. It's everybody knows still it. recruiting to this day. But it's what put the SEALs on the map. In the public's eye, the SEALs already existed, although combat control existed long before SEALs or Green Berets, I like to point out to people. But the fact is, that movie stamped the SEALs in the public eye. Dick Marsenko, Death of the Delta, you know, all the stuff he did in Vietnam, whatever these things were, guys in Korea with a grenade and a single 45 sneaking up on the beach, Great history, but no one knew about it. But this movie comes along, and suddenly in the public eye, SEALs are everything, and they've never looked back. <laughs> For me, that's my mission with that book. Now, I've, I've got a new book, and I hope, well, well, I'm sure we'll talk about it, but that's the purpose of that book. And now we're going to make a very big budget film with yeah, Jake well, Gyllenhaal and Sam Hargrave as a director, who's a really great guy. And I'm really excited because I think it's going to put the Air Force and combat control on the map. I can't wait. I actually had this this conversation with the, the general of AFRS in this very room about the movie. And then <laughs> um, the, the new AFRS general, or is it, uh, was it Jeannie Levitt? Uh, no, the new one. Okay. Uh, Tom. I don't know him. I just knew D general Levitt okay. who I really like. Cause she's the air force's first female fighter pilot and she just kicks ass. <laughs> she's really cool. Okay. So, so you get through in doc. It's crazy. What, what were the instructors like back then? Because you've got a, you know, early eighties and they did what they with, wanted. Yeah. There it was, was no it was a free fall oversight. No. In the pool, they did whatever they wanted. Like, I just remember one day, you know, crossovers, anyone who went through Army SF combat dive course, we all, everyone knows about crossovers. They don't do them anymore because they killed too many people. <laughs> and so you'd have to do yeah, eight of these things. Them. What are they? What is this? Well, you get in the pool, deep end of an Olympic-sized pool, and you got twin 80 tanks on, no regulator. You don't get any air to breathe, folks. And 16-pound um, weight belt, fins, and a mask. And you drop down and you fin across the bottom of the pool to the other side of the deep end. And then you get to come up. But it's an oxygen debt exercise. So you're expending more oxygen going across the pool. Then when you get up to the other side, they give you an interval to catch your breath. But the interval is not enough to replenish the oxygen debt that you incurred. So you're building this hypoxic and you're building this panic response physiologically. And the goal is to suppress that enough that you can swim until... If you brown out or black out, you'll just keep going. And it's a great stress test. And, you know, you can take food, you can take water, you can keep people up. But when you take oxygen, it is a totally different game. So you do eight of those. And with decreasing intervals, like starts with one minute, then 45 seconds and whatever. And we did one day, the instructor's like, you know, we're, today we're just going to do 16. <laughs> and we did them. One guy, Doug Eccleston, another great combat controller, became a PJ, got killed on a rescue mission, was a dear friend of mine. And he, I watched him black out and they pulled him up out of the water, pumped him out, make sure he was okay, and asked him a question. 
Are you getting in the pool? Or are you getting out of the pool? What are you going to do? And he got back in the pool. And that's why 150 guys started. 15 walked out the door eight weeks later. Where was your uh, Where was your first assignment after graduating? Like, uh, well, first that uh, CCS was the final phase. Of yeah, this, that, correct. There's no point, AST. No, there's none, no none of the, Herber- none of the so great programs. You graduate from Fort Bragg, and I go down to and you get your beret. Yeah, and, and so you I, go to the two three. Yeah, so oh, I was that's a, really cool. Jet skier, you know, I grew up skateboarding as a teenager in Southern California and uh, I bought a jet ski and I'm like, I jet skied in the ocean, you know, it was my thing. But here was the deal. Best place in the world to be a comic controller in the 80s. Herbert Field, there's an NCO yes, club on the dude. beach. It was brilliant. You could, <coughs> you could drink and drive legally back then. And so you could have an open <laughs> container in your car in oh Florida. <laughs> now, I'm not recommending that for people, but the, but the bottom line is, man, you could do that. So it was a good place. I was augmenting the 2-4, which was the 1724th at the time, which was JSOC. Yeah. And at, at that point, I realized that's where I needed to go. If you wanted to be the best in the world and work with Dev Group and Delta, you know, Delta Force, no. like that's where you had to go. And it's still that way now. And I talk about it in my book. But for me, I was willing to give up anything in order to get there and work with the best in the world. And so I went there and spent X number of years and... Um, and that's where I went, you know, Mogadishu, Black Hawk Down, First Gulf War, whatever. The things that I got to do during that period, which really developed oh, me yeah. and shaped so me when, as a human. What, was there a selection for the 24th? Oh, yeah, absolutely. What, and, and walk us through that. Well, it's, it's uh, uh, you know, you do, there's a, there's a different version of the long walk, the way Delta does it. They, we, what was cool about our selection? Well, you suffered through it. Don't get me wrong. None of it was cool. But because we spent our time working with the Navy's best and the Army's best, we drew from both of those communities to build what we thought was the right product for us. Because they were, they're, quite, they're quite insular. They still are. They don't really overlap the way people think. They're, they have different cultures. They have different command structures. They have different planning. You know, the way they execute missions is very different. So for us, we pulled from both of those. And, you know, so you, you're out by yourself. You land nav. You do team events. You have to do, you know, go without sleep and all this other stuff and the psychological stresses that they put you under. And it's not even worth bogging down on, but like my class, we started with 11 and I was the only guy that got selected. Oh, wow. What year was this? Um, 88, I think. And um, so I went up to the hill and you know, the two, four. Yeah. And I was at the 14th. So I, yeah, you were right, I looked right at out it. the gate. I looked at, right looked at out it the over gate. the fence. Yeah. Like, oh, there I remember is. when you guys were there and then you guys <laughs> ended up with much better digs once JSOC bought you out. Yeah. Like yeah, a property much. development Ooh, and across the base. Yeah. Which worked out really well for you guys. And so, uh, so I ended up there and I did that for, you know, 10 years and then I got out of the military and I did my bachelor's degree while I was a comic control instructor. That's why I left the two, four. I wanted to try and get a degree and, and figure out what I wanted to do with my life. So I got out, no job, no place to live, no retirement. I just moved to Utah you and just- packed it in. Left the two for it at that point. You must have had fifteen years of service uh, at eleven. Yeah, some yeah. change so over a decade. But um, but wait, Mogadishu, what happened there? So I was a comic controller, and um, you know, I was at when when Somalia first kicked off in uh, spring of ninety three. I was on alert with um, B Squadron at Delta Force, and that's who had the mission. So we did all. The, I was one of the original mission planners, and. We were almost going to go several times. We even loaded the plane one time on the ramp at Yellow Ramp, waiting to go, and they canceled the mission. I'm like, God, thank God, I'm tired of this mission. And we swapped over to C Squadron, so some other guys from Two Four took over, and um, I was off the mission, which I was happy to be because I was going to go to the tandem course and be a tandem master. And then it kicks off again, and my my chief came to me. He's like, "We're going again. You're running the planners. You should go back over to Delta and get a job." I'm like, "What does that mean?" It's like, go back over there and find yourself a position. You should be part of what we're going to do. <laughs> so I did, and I did, and I ended up in Somalia with the Rangers as part of Task Force Ranger. And um, yeah, and you know, was on all the missions and helped Mark Bowden with the book and did some consulting with yeah. Jay Bruckheimer. So you, went, you rolled out with the, with the Rangers. Yeah, I was, on the, I was in the lead Humvee um, for on, the, on October 3rd. And then when we rolled back to the, to the airport, to rearm because we, we were Winchester, but most guys were out. I was taking the ammo off of wounded and dead guys. Um, when we went back out for the second rescue, I was definitely going back out because, you know, my two best friends in the world were out there. One's a PJ, one's a controller, and I had to go back out. Anyway, so I went back out and we kicked ass. 
That mission is not a failure as has been perceived through the press and for much of the public eye's history around the events because 18 guys died and we killed between 1,000 and 1,500 Somalis. It, was that they, your first combat experience? That was my first real combat. So I mean, what, first Gulf War, I was you know out doing whatever, but I, like it was, and I was in Central America in the 80s. This was my first real gunfights. This was like, it was a big oh. gun, and I'd been in some other gunfights, but like that gunfight, well, it's still yeah, singular. It, 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 it just lasted. 18 hours, man. And, uh, <laughs> and so, but you know, I'd like to tell people, and I make this point's very important to me and speaking on behalf of everyone who was there, which I'm not an official spokesman for, but I feel strongly about, man, I, I challenge any country in the world to put 200 guys in that position and not only have the, the mission be a success, we went out and rolled up the guys we went. We lost three of them in the crossfire. They got killed. But I challenge any other country to have even one man walk out alive. We were the best in the world. Everybody there. And that's what America's special operations are. They're the best in the world. And uh, man, I'm honored to just have been a part of that process. I'd trade the experience for the 18 lives we lost, but uh, that defined me a lot. And it defined a lot of us. I mean, look at Scotty Miller, General Miller. Like he's the last general. He was a captain in C Squadron at the time. And like a lot of us who were part of that mission. I am. <laughs> yeah. Keep labor. I mean, you know, people that are, people know their names a lot. Um, these guys and, uh, you know, Gary Gordon and, and Randy Shugart. I mean, those guys are, are legendary for their sacrifice. But it, it, it stamped a whole group of people that went on to do other things. And, um, the, you know, it's, you carry that with you for the rest of your life and you can't escape it. It's important to embrace it anyway because we need to honor those guys we lost. But it was a, man, that was a successful mission. But for me, I, you know, it's funny because I got out it's going back to where we were in this narrative. And uh, I ended up in the in the SF and the Guard SF. Some guys recruited me like, you should so, join the Guard. So yeah, you left. And where'd you go? When back you, to Utah. You went that's to Utah. Home. That, that, okay. That's where I landed. I'm, I'm a Utah boy. I mean, I've been born in Newport Beach and grew up as a surf, skate Nazi yeah, kid, whatever. brought you to Utah? Uh, my dad was a rocket scientist and he moved there to do missile defense, like Minuteman okay. missiles and yeah. stuff like that. And um, so, but I fell in love with Utah. Skiing, mountains, rock climbing. But uh, I went, that was where I went. I went back home. And uh, so now I'm going to graduate school. I started my own business and I got into the SF and I'm running the Halo program basically for the 19th group. Because back then, this is, this is 96, um, not a lot of guys with a lot of Halo experience. And I had a lot of Halo experience. So yeah, they you guys hired were jumping me to be your asses guy. off yeah, at the 24th. I, I had a pro rating, skydiver, all, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, um, and I like parachutes, obviously. You know, base jumping is my my world record for base jumping. Like those are things I like to do. <laughs> and so I loved it, man. I had a great time in the SF and that's, I met, ended up meeting Evan through another mutual friend, Jeff Kirkham. And you know, the six degrees of Kevin Bacon or Evan Hafer, I don't know, whatever that is. And uh, it's a small world. Right. And so I did that. Did they make you go through the Q course or anything? I didn't or, want to go through the Q course. Or they're just like, well, we're just going to give you a job and we're just like gonna... run the halo stuff. Like, well, I was a staff sergeant. And uh, I was running the Halo program. In fact, um, I what, ended up getting MOS, my commission. Uh, I had two MOSs in the Army because I had been a rigger. Oh, yeah. I, I went to rigger school, so I had the rigger MOS and I had 11B. Oh, so wow. they just plugged me in with an MOS. And oh, I didn't like, do any, like, yeah. yeah, just hang out, run Halo stuff. And I'm like, okay, I can do that. But um, uh, I asked how I got my commission because I retired as a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force. But a chief warrant officer, <laughs> Byrne, he's an SF. You know, 18 series guy. <laughs> he's like, you should have a commission. I'm like, ah, I don't want a commission. What do I care about that? I'm, I just do this because it's fun. Yeah. And one day he comes to work. He's like, here, fill out this paperwork. And I'm like, commission package. I'm like, I mean, I'm not doing this. He's like, fill out the paperwork. Well, CW4 from your ODA tells you to fill out the paperwork. What do you do? You fill it out. <laughs> fill it out. <laughs> so two months later, he calls me up. He's like, hey, your commission's here. And they got me a direct commission. I had nothing to do with it at all. I you didn't have like, to go through OCS or nothing. It was no, because I told him, I'm like, I'm not doing that. I'm not interested in going something where I crawl through a ditch and guys are yelling at me about combat. I'm like, I got more combat than anybody here before the war. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm not doing that. So I ended up with a direct commission and <laughs> was surprised me more than anybody. <laughs> I do. <laughs> and so I ran their rigor, the pro, ran the riggers uh, and the, the cooks and the mechanics and everything for First Battalion, Nineteenth Group, like and then I got battalion. back in. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. I didn't. I wasn't a long tab guy. Yeah, and I wasn't interested in going to the Q course. I didn't want to. I'm not going through another selection. Well, it's a valid process, but yeah. I at that point in my life, man, like it's not what I was looking to do. 
And, uh, and then I ended up doing some stuff on the Olympics. Uh, all, a lot of us from the 19th did. And I got called up by this general from Oregon, who's an Air National Guard general. He's an Air Force general. He's like, hey, we want to create a special tactics squadron out here in Oregon. And I'd like to talk to you about it. And I'm like, well, the only thing the Army, the Air Force hates more than a prior enlisted Army guy is a prior commissioned Army guy. And I said, I'm both of those things. But if you want to fly out to Utah and buy me a beer, General, come on out. <laughs> and he did. And this is not, I'm, this is a cliche. I'm this not is making awesome. This up. <laughs> We're drinking beer. I got a beer stained napkin. I'm like, here's what it takes to, to create an ST squadron, get AFSOC to buy off on this. And, and the National Guard Bureau's got to be involved. So I built this little Ponzi scheme. Yeah. And I'm like, if you do these things and you can get me in the Air Force, I guarantee you, which was kind of a fabrication, that I can create an ST squadron for you. <laughs> And so he got me into the Air Force, and then I, 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 my whole house of cards was falling apart. And then lo and behold, Hurricane Katrina saved my life because I had no real money to fund $15 million for the initial, you know, equipment build, build of, yeah, yeah. of an ST squadron. And after that, after Katrina, the guard gave me $12 million to start my squadron because I, I was just making this up as a captain. Like I was just making it up as I went along, telling everybody this is going to work out. I need this many vehicles. I need two oh, well, boats. Well, we knew the list. We had yeah. it all. And so uh, it's hard to spend $15 million at $50 or $5,000 a pop. Like $15 million is a lot of money or $12 million is a lot of money. Anyway, so I ended up back in the Air Force. And now I'm a squadron commander as a captain. And then I went, finished my career. I went back to JSOC and, and stood up in a special mission unit. And I was the first commander of another Special mission unit, and uh, and then I spent the rest of my career at JSOC. Really? Um, yep. So you were over at JSOC until when? 2016. Oh wow! When I retired, and I and I finished my last gig. I did. I was like the interagency guy for JSOC on WMD. So I spent a lot of time at CIA and what NSA. What was your What was your AFSC? Like, I didn't what matter officer at that point. were you? <laughs> well, I was a stow. Oh, a you were a stow? Officer. Yeah. Okay. So I came in, I came back in as a stow because yeah. I was a special. <laughs> what were you? <laughs> yeah. At this point, I became a stow again. So I was actually enlisted and commissioned in the Army and enlisted and commissioned in the Air Force, all four. <laughs> so it's like, I don't really have a career chart. It's more like a Rorschach blot. You yeah, look at like, it and you're like, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. But I, I like doing things that I find are interesting. It's and it's like you guys. More effective, it seems like. People were like, hey, this is the guy we need. Let's just make it happen. <laughs> I'm a I'm a make it happen guy. Yeah, I like I I like doing things that I think are that stretch me and make are very hard for me. It's why I became a writer. Writing is a very difficult thing for me, uh, and in a lot of ways, I'm really insecure about it. And like Alona Don's a New York Times bestseller, and it's going to be this you know hundred million dollar film or something, and Jake Gyllenhaal and all these things. But at the end of the day, for someone like us, you know, it's and I think you've done the same kind of thing where you reinvent yourself. You come out of the military and look what you're doing. Look what you guys are doing here. Um, for me, it was, okay, I'm not the action guy I was. You know, yeah, I got world record for base jumps and I used to skydive a lot and, and, and you know, s extreme ski or whatever. But as you get older and you want to become something more and evolve and advance yourself and challenge yourself, it becomes, well, what do I do now? And for me, it was writing. And I love stories. And I love impacting people's lives. And this is my way of doing it. And it forces me to be something that I was not. No action guy skills required. Yeah, but identifying that, hey, it's time to move on from that. I mean, that's the first step. I think because it's how many step. how many of our peers that you know are E8s and E9s right now that are still trying to fight to be on the team? <laughs> well, because yeah. we're comfortable with that identity. But challenging yeah. as it is, yeah. it's actually easier than starting over. Did you know, with Black Rifle Coffee's Coffee Club subscription, you can get fresh coffee shipped to you every month? What? You don't even have to go to the store. Whoa. You don't even have to leave your bed. What? Wow. How did you get in here? You might want to go ahead and join the Black Rifle Coffee Club subscription before one of these guys shows up at your place. And I really encourage a lot of veterans that come from our world, and especially like you and me, you know, TACP and combat control are really overlooked in the public's eye and even by the Air Force. So what do you do when you try and start over? I mean, you need to find something that you want to do. It may be hard. You may hate parts of it. You're not going to just follow your passion. It's all roses. Look at what you're doing. It's hard work. It looks fun. You're shooting machine guns. You're 
jumping motorcycles over helicopters, whatever. (laughs) Like it's cool, but it's still hard work and it's things you don't want to do. But it's important to say, well, what is it that I can do and what do I want to do now? And you know, something I would say to any veteran that's listening is you've earned the right if you've served this country, the greatest country in the world, to start over and do what you want. And you should. But you have to realize it's because you're no longer it's gonna a tech be work or a too. controller or a yeah. green beret or whatever. And it's going to be work. Yeah. Yeah. So what? where were you at when Bruckheimer approaches you for the movie Black Hawk Down? Well, so and they were already in process. And um, how did you, yeah, how did your name come up and you get involved and what role did you play in that? Because I didn't have a very big role. I didn't go for filming when they went to Rabat, Morocco, because I was running my own business at the time. I was in the 19th group and I didn't really have time to go, which was unfortunate. I really wanted to. But Jerry was a really nice guy and he was really committed to making a, a quality film. And uh, which he did. He, he did. Yeah, I still agree. to this day. It, and I can't watch it, but I don't know why I've seen it twice. Once when it first came out and once a few years ago with some buddies. And I'm like, I can't watch this movie. And um, I, I just don't enjoy watching it. Uh, but it was funny because he's a really big movie producer, one of the biggest in the world. And so I got to do some consulting. We talked about things. And I, my role, I felt, was to explain things to him that weren't part of the movie or the plot. I really wanted to talk about why we do the things that we do and who we are as operators. And I think that was an important thing to inject into them because they had a lot of experts for technicalities and what's a gunshot wound look like when people bleed out and what's an RPG explosion look like. I'm not that guy. And so I I got to do that. But what really impressed me about him in the end was a year and a half goes by or something. I'm driving down the road and it's a typical Hollywood moment. The phone rings, I pick it up and like, please hold for Mr. Buckheimer because these guys never dial their own phone. And I'm like, okay. And so I was actually going on a camping trip with my son. And I'm like, hold on, buddy, I got to take this call. And he's like, hey, Dan, this is Jerry. And I'm like, what can I do for you? The movie's been out. He's like, well, I'm in Germany promoting the film internationally. And I just wanted to call and see what you thought. What does he care about what I think? I was so stunned that this guy would remember even who I was. I haven't talked to him again. And I said, okay, well, I'll tell you. I thought it was graphically very realistic. And I think you did a great job of making us not look like we're automatons, you know, and we don't, killing doesn't mean anything. Or conversely, the typical Hollywood reaction, Hollywood reaction is we're so devastated by our experience, we can no longer function in life, like the deer hunter or something else. And I said, you, I think you threaded that. And I think it's an honorable movie. And I'm really proud to have been associated with it. And I think you did a good job. And it mattered to him. And so now I'm making this other movie with, with, MGM and the Highway Entertainment and Three Line Entertainment. And these are really smart people. I, I stand in a room with them and I realize I'm the least smart person in this room, <laughs> which is kind of humbling because we're, we're our, from our community, there's a lot of smart guys in special ops. And I'm like, man, I am not the smartest guy here. You're, you're the first person I've ever heard say that. <laughs> that, that network executives are smart Oh, people. I don't know about network executives, uh, or, uh, but I can tell you the movie producers making movie, this movie. Movie executives. They're, they're, they, are, <laughs> they know how to make money. They know what resonates with people. Now, um, you know, they have their own vision and it changes what the screenwriter does. Or, you know, at the end though, it's the director. He gets to do what he wants. And for this movie to be about John Chapman and combat control, and that's the working title, it's combat control, yeah. um, is going to, is going to transform a lot of people's perceptions and I think change lives for the better. This is, this is Navy SEALs for the Air Force. I mean, yeah, this is- except for it's a love story. I, I think this is, I'm not speaking for the studios. I'm, I'm not that person. I get to be a producer on the movie, but to me, it's a love story. It's a love story between John and Valerie, his wife. And it's a love story between John and the guys on the mountain that he sacrificed himself for, including the guys who left him for dead. This is a love story wrapped in a war movie. And it's, and it's written not like other war movies. And I think it's going to be very powerful. And uh, I'm, really, I'm really happy to see this thing coming into fruition. And it's a cool thing to do. I get, I get to help make movies. You know, this I've is, done I mean, some help with stunts and stuff. This is going to be huge. And that's the thing is, this movie, Anaconda has tried, the, the Tucker Gar has been attempted to be made a number of years. But yeah. The but problem the, was- From is different if, angles. Yeah. From different angles. Like there was, there was a really- uh, shitty movie. What, like ten years ago? Oh, I don't even know that. That like, I don't watch a lot of war movies. Touched, you know, touched on it, but it was just horrible. Like, but to see the the budget being put into this, I mean, this is great pride for guys like us. And they believe. Uh, I'll tell you that the the president of the, of one of the studios, a guy I've come to admire quite a bit. His name's Matt. Um, 
man, he's like, you know, I be- and he's made some, you know, small budget movies like Men in Black, stuff like that. <laughs> so, but he, so he's small. Yeah, 27 years, this guy's been making movies. And he, uh, he's like, I believe this movie is the most powerful movie I've ever been associated with. And we wanted to make sure in the spirit of John, it's a dramatization, it's not a documentary. But in the spirit of John's sacrifice and his heroism, we want to make sure we do this right. And that everybody, I don't know why they feel like they have to say this to me. Maybe it's because I'm, I'm really, you know, I wrote the book on this subject um, and they view me as this action guy, whatever. But I, they, they, every time I talk to these people are like, we want to make sure we're doing this right. And I'm like, of course, I, I, I do too. I'm here to help. Now, have you seen the script? Yeah, I got to, yeah, I got to help Michael with now, the, the, a little uh, bit with it. Is it? Fairly accurate, or are we trying to make the Navy look good? <laughs> it's, it is, it is, um, it is, it is, it is an accurate portrayal of what John went through, but it's it's still going to be dramatized and stylized. And what they really add to it is, you know, I mean, the drama of what happens with John's medal. To, yeah, well, they're going to change stuff. Um, to because uh, I know a lot of uh, a few of the Rangers that you know talk about the the crazy shit the Navy pulled afterwards, you know, trying yeah. to, trying to essentially tell guys during their sworn statements, oh, that's not, that's not John. They're like, no, no, it is. That's where yeah. we, that's where we pick. I know, I know a Sergeant Major uh, that, that has sat in, in, in our office in El Paso and said that a Navy 06 and a Navy 05 argued with him for almost an hour, trying to convince him that he didn't grab John out of the trench and that John was killed way over here. And they're like, no, like they said, it was so shady. So like, there's, there is controversy. I, I chose not to touch on that in the book because my book is not about any type of betrayal. It's about John and just, combat control. Yeah. So I'm here to take the positive tack, but yeah, there is controversy about that. And um, I, I have all of that information, obviously, but I, in the end, it's not the Navy. It was a handful of people who had an agenda. And it's the first time in the Medal of Honor history that one service contested another service's submission. And they shouldn't well, do also, that. Also, they awarded it first to the guy that lived. That is just a disgrace to anyone yeah. in this process. Like I, I, I don't voice my opinions on the events that surround Slab's medal. He certainly didn't ask for it. Um, so you know, I don't lay that on his shoulders. It was a Navy decision big Navy t- to pursue that. And they chose to pursue it. And to me, that has nothing to do with me. I'm here to tell John's story and, and promote combat control. The Navy gets enough attention already. They don't need any help from me. And, and that's okay. And, you know, it's, I, I've got, you know, I've got some great friends at Dev Group still to this day, people that I greatly admire, some of the best operators in the world. The fact that some of these people ultimately betrayed John's heroism that's on them. And they got to live with that because the fact is John did what he did. And you can pretend like the sun's not coming up in the East tomorrow either. Neither one of those are true. <laughs> like it, it, John did what he did. And uh, we know it's a fact. It's not a, it's not a mystery. Yeah. You know, I mean, guys heard him Delta force and, 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 and another good friend of mine, Jay Hill, who was out with them behind enemy lines. He was listening to John. He could hear John. John never responded. But the fact is John was calling out on the radio long after the seals had retreated and left him for dead. There's no gray area here. <laughs> and so for John to get that, you know, for the Air Force, this is a big deal. And, you know, back to us talking movies early on, the Air Force has finally got a movie. Every time the movie, Air Force is in a movie, you know, Tyrese Gibson was a combat controller in Transformers. It's backstory. Captain Marvel was an yeah, F-35. Yeah, but you know what? Pilot. It's got to put some blame on their shoulders. The Air Force? We, they drug their feet on the metal. They drug their feet on this. So it's like, yeah, it's because of weak backbone leaders that didn't want to stand up. To the Navy. The, and I like, think, I think that's part of it. But I think more to the core of the matter is the Air Force doesn't promote heroism the way the other services do. No, they refuse do. to. I mean, We're it's, wallflowers when it comes to standing up and going, this is our guy. And the Air Force doesn't do that, especially if it's not a pilot. They've done a disservice to all of our guys in the GWAT. Because there, there we are only medals have- of honor, I think, in, in the Air Force right now, only one of which has been awarded. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there's plenty more when you start pe- peeling back a lot of these stories. It's not like if you start, so. if you start, if you take take these incidents and and put them right up against the the army who is in the 30s yeah. of of recipients, and we have one. Right. Who's failing here? Well, who's failing the 
not only but we're also people. proportionally smaller. So, you know, there's a lot of, when you start to look at stats, you can say, okay, we can compare. But at the end of the day, it still comes down to what did the individual do? What risks did they take? What sacrifices did they make? Who did they save? What were the yeah, circumstances? We're not shortchanged on that, on, on no, our guys' story. Our guys have done like, <laughs> more, so much. You know, Guys I, like Ish Villegas. <laughs> yep. Chris Baradat, Bob Gutierrez, Gutierrez. Dustin Temple. Yeah. To me, those guys are medals of honor. And I say this as a, I'm not a subject matter expert on the Medal of Honor, but I'm a quasi-expert on, on the Medal of Honor. And I understand a lot. And I've, I came to be friends with the Pentagon's central staffer for the medal. And her job is to make sure the medal is awarded appropriately. And she's the, sort of, a, she guarantees that this is standard is met. And so she's, she is a very amazing lady. And through her, I've really come to learn where medals stand, what should be a medal and what shouldn't. And we have at least three. And I, and I think the Air Force is, is, should be doing more to push those. And it's not the Air Force's way sometimes. And that's our problem with being Air Force guys. But it's, yeah. hell, it's no different than being a TACP or controller. You yeah, they're, only, they're only doing a disservice to the people in the service. To, but they're doing to, to rob the- us of those, you know, all the Army, all the members of the United States Army has 30 people to look up to and to know their stories, to do their professional military education That's reports right. on these guys. As, and, well and deserved. Yes. And, they, and they should. But the, the, the great irony here is it's a disservice to our own entire service to not recognize exactly. what these guys did. That's what I mean. And there's no downside to the Air Force. And I, and I think it's just a cultural they thing. They feel like if they give... Our guys credit that it's that it somehow is taking it away from somebody else, and that's not the case. It is not like, the case, and I don't I don't know that I can I don't know that I can say that definitively. But I, I for whatever reason, the Air Force doesn't push those types of narratives, and um, it's a, just a cultural thing, and it's it's an oddity. It's and it's unfortunate. Yeah, yeah it is. Yeah. So, but John got his, and I and I I am hopeful. That there's at least one more in the pipeline. I won't share any details. I know, kind of I know, I know two that are that are. So I think we'll get another. Tottering. I think we'll. I think we'll get at least one more, and hopefully we'd get more, but at least one more. Did and you get to go to the ceremony? Yeah, I went to the White House. Oh, awesome. um, I didn't do the rest of the ceremonies because I was I was locked into some other stuff. But I I literally dashed out of the White House to catch a flight. But it was such an honor to be there with with John's family and and Valerie John's widow to be there and his daughters. The girls were there. To, to watch the president award this medal, man, it was just, it was, it was really powerful for me. Um, but it, to me, it's not as, it wasn't as powerful for me personally as when I have talked to people who knew John and they have read the book that Lori and I wrote and, and, you know, the words that we, that are in this book about who John was as a person and what John did on the mountain. Like I have been really emotionally impacted by that sometimes. And in a, in a very profound way. And uh, even the screenplay. When I, the first time I read the screenplay, I broke down and cried. And it's not like I haven't worked with this material for years, yeah. every day. I spent a week writing But to writing see it in that form, well, and that's got to so, be... And it's emotionally very powerful yeah. because they have some, some artistic license that I don't have as a biographer and a historian. In that case, you know, that book is really military history. You know, this book is how not to get robbed, raped, or carjacked. It was very different <laughs> subjects. So for me, this, you know, that was... Man, and I can't wait to see that on screen. Yeah. yeah. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, probably, it'll be probably at least 2023 before the, it hits theaters. How do we get on the premiere list? Uh, you, <laughs> well, let me know. Well, uh, we, we can talk about well, that. I would there's love some, to be there's there. Some, there's some alignment, I think, between what Absolutely. Black Rifle does. I would love to, to be promoting that film all the way up to its release. Yeah, so. I'm, I'm just excited to be part of the movie. Like that, to me, like to be there and help out is really cool. That's awesome. All right, let's talk about your most recent book. Yeah. Get into this. What is this? So this is The Power of Awareness. Um, it is, it's designed to help you avoid becoming a victim of crime. And I wrote it for the typical citizen, traveler of the world, and women in particular, because women are the preponderance of targets for uh, violent crime, whether it's in a relationship or, you know, whether it's a a mugger or a rapist, um, and the perpetrators are almost always dudes. But the fact is, the best way to be safe is it's not about Krav Maga. It's not about concealed carry. Those are tools that you use when you're having a problem. This is use your situational awareness. Understand what that is. So I talk about that there's situation, which is external to me, where I am, we're in the studio, what's around me. We've got a couple guys, sound guy, everything else. You know, what's the threats? 
not likely there's a door here, a door there. So two exits, all that kind of stuff. That's external. That's my situation. But what matters to the individual, and this is one of the things I teach in the book is, what's my appropriate level of awareness? You and me in the studio, we're oblivious. We don't care what these two guys are doing. Yeah. But if we were having this in the public on a street in on, you know, Avenue of the Americas in Manhattan at 2 a.m. in our speakers, we should be really aware. Well, I mean, uh, during your your research and and everything for this book, of what what is the percentage of 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 I I would imagine there is a high percentage of just avoiding certain situations will that, will increase your survivability by just right. basically going, hey, I mean, I kind of I kind of think about that, you know. We don't necessarily drive after 7 p.m. We're not out on the road. So, I mean, right. my chances of being hit by a struck by a drunk driver substantially go lower because you're just not putting yourself that's right in the playing field. That's and so it's it's the same thing. Understand your situation, understand how where you should be, and think about those things beforehand. That's the best key to avoiding a, a criminal act or a threat to your person. But the other component. There's, there's two legs I stand down as a foundation for my book and my approach to personal safety. Situational awareness is one. And the other is listening to your intuition. The problem for guys like you and me is we override our intuition all the time. So little voice is talking to you. And I like to tell people in the civilian world, it's like, you know that email that you, you feel like you have to get done and send off, or you're really angry and you send it off. And as soon as you send that, instantly you're like, shouldn't have done that. But a voice was telling you not to do that. But you, I needed to get it done, or I'm really pissed <laughs> off, and you override that intuition. It's the same thing if I work in an office building, and I cross a dark parking lot every night, and I'm used to this parking lot. It's black. It's not lit. But it's 100 yards to my car. But I open the door one night, and I stop. For whatever reason, something is speaking to me. What do I do in that situation? Change your behavior. But that's not what most people do. No. It's only 100 yards. Change your path. It's going to be fine. And the th trick is to learn to listen to that voice, which is a million years of yesterday. evolution that you overrode it. Yeah, I, 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 I listened. That's I left. I left. Uh, I left our other uh, area where all our horses and stuff are mm -hmm. at, and didn't feel right. So I turned around and waited for the kids to to get in front of me and escorted them home. <laughs> and it doesn't matter why. And this is one of the things. That's about what I said. I'm like, I have. I'm not in a hurry. I have nowhere to be. Hell, let's let's run with this. And if you do, you're actually listening to that voice that allowed every ancestor you ever had for the last 100,000 years to survive long enough to procreate to produce you. <laughs> but they were very in tune with their intuition because the, it, it's existential. We've, we were talking about the nervous system before we, we got on the interview, and you've got the separate nervous system. That's why we call it a gut instinct because you, you it'll respond to things. You may not consciously know what that is, but your body's responding to something. And the two things that are absolutely true about that, and I don't speak in absolutes very often, but the, they are this. You're responding to something existential. There is something really there. You may not know, but your body's telling you something's there. And the second thing is, it's 100% in your interest to listen to that voice. <laughs> but when you and I are doing things, TAC-P, combat controller, and attached to ODA or Ranger Platoon, and we're going to go off and do something, and we're going to get we in that over, building. We override. And it's like, we shouldn't go in that building. And I say that to the team leader, and he's like, well, why? I don't know. I'm just telling you. What happens if they listen to me? Nothing. Because we didn't do it. And then afterwards, it reinforces the wrong behavior amongst professionals. It's like, hey, dude, nothing happened. Uh, what the well, hell were like, you talking about? You don't about? know what could have happened. That, and you can never prove or, a negative. Hey, man, that's personal I, safety. I don't, I don't have a feeling about this jump. Yeah, but that's something that we override every time. Because and we've, sometimes you have we've to. been told, hey, if you're a jump refusal, you're done. And so there, <laughs> that's why it's harder for professionals like you and me. And this is why the book is for the typical citizen. Walking out of that dark office building to go across the street or waiting for the kids because I feel like I need to. How disruptive is it really at the cost of if you don't listen to it and something bad happens, was it worth it? The answer is no, it's never worth it. And so... Women face live in a world of double standards in society. I can't speak for women, but you know, I spent a lot of time in my research in this book with police detectives and female CIA case officers. And I came to really understand that women can be put in positions where they could become victims of a crime for two reasons. One, they don't want to look silly. 
or they don't want to be rude because they're judged differently by society. And so they will sometimes they're put themselves in a position. Positionally, but they're trying not to be rude. Right. Hey, let me walk you to this. It's right. like- I'm holding the elevator for you or let yeah. me in your apartment complex. I talk about a serial rapist in Venice Beach in here um, and, and why- he kept using this MO that worked. He would follow women into their apartment complex, lock gate, secure apartment complex. Yeah. And he's like, hey, hold the gate. And all of them responded with, this guy's a creep. Two of them let him in because they didn't want to be rude. And, and so the book helps people come to understand how not to do that. So I provide exercises in here to help people reinforce their intuition and then understand situational awareness. So they're in the book, but the other thing I felt that was important, and I hope people listening will take this away with them, and I hope people buy the book. This book is to save lives, yeah. um, is the exercises are free on my website. So people buy the book. I hope they talk about it. But six months later, you and I are having a beer. And it's like, what the hell was Schilling talking about with, you know, walking the street to determine surveillance detection and, you know, things like that. Pull up the phone, look at it and go, oh, this is what he's talking about. And I can get the dialogue going again. Because it's iterative. They need to practice yeah. this. Yeah. So that's that. So that's the book. And uh, that's why I'm out on tour. And it's a, nice. When did it come out? Uh, this month, actually. Oh, the, the 2nd of June, I think. And um, it's uh, it's already being translated into Mandarin and Russian. <laughs> Go figure. Wow. Yeah. Well, uh, going to just maybe one more case study, because you, you did a lot of research for this. I'd love to hear another instance that you, that you saw pattern behavior that led to you know, someone putting themselves in a position that, that made them a victim. So I'm in Baja, Mexico. I'm getting ready to race in the Baja 1000. And we've been down there pre-running the race course for a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. you, have you raced down there? No. Okay. But, uh, you know, BJ is a good okay. buddy of ours. So, so, um, so we're down there pre-running the race course. I'm with my race buddy. It's his race car. And we're two weeks. We're in Mexico. You're, we're dialed in. We feel really comfortable. You, you know, Mexican culture. I love Mexican culture. People are friendly. Food's great. Love the weather. And so we're coming back to Tijuana and going to San Diego and we're done. And we're going to speed fly because he's a speed flyer too. So we're going to climb up the top of a mountain, throw out our speed wings and do a little speed flight down to the truck. And as we get off the highway, I've speed flown this mountain a number of times. Um, we got our race car on the back of the truck, our chase truck, all our tools, all our race gear, our lead nav system for running the race course, all this stuff. It's hundred plus thousand dollars worth of stuff. And uh, JT's like, I oh, will stop and speed fly really quick. And it's a 10 minute climb and then two minute speed fly. And then we get in the truck and keep going. As we got off the highway, little dirt road, shacks, goats around. And, you know, Sunday morning, I wave to people. No one's waving back. I'm like, eh, that was odd. And I could just feel like, I don't think we should stop today and do this. And we've done it before. Anyway, we, climb, we get out of the truck and we're climbing to the top of the mountain as we get up there. Car pulls up. Jay, we're looking at 600 yards. If I have a 300 wind mag, I can solve this problem. Yeah. And my race partner's like, hey, man, there's a car pulling up. We should probably get down there. I'm like, yep, probably. And 90 seconds later, they jacked our truck, had it hot wired, and it was gone in a trail of dust. And I'm standing there going, 30 years of special ops, clan work, special operations work. And I've never lost so much as a T-shirt. And I just let a $100,000 race vehicle disappear in a cloud of dust because I didn't listen to my intuition. Wow. And that's why I wrote the book. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah. That was, that was the catalyst for this. And I'm like, God, man, I've never had this problem. And my agent had been hounding me to write this book. So yeah. I think you should write this. I'm like, no, this no. is great. I'm excited for it. It's, like, yeah. It's, and so hopefully it's easy to understand. And uh, man, I want people to travel the world. There's a lot of anxiety coming out of the pandemic. Yeah. People are trying to get used to what travel looks like. The book's really simple yeah, to understand. For anybody that does world travel, this is probably great. Yeah. Like, like, this is what you need. So that's the new book. Where can and, people uh, yeah, find you? Anywhere. Find this. DanChillingBooks.com. You know, I speed fly all the time still. You can find videos there. I got, you know, there's fun videos. Yeah. Um, there's What's your world record? Uh, I have the most base jumps in 24 hours. Oh, how many is that? 201. Damn. That's a lot. It was, it was a good day. Broke my arm eight hours in. It was a big a bit of a problem. 
Wow. <laughs> That's why you have PJs. So I had a PJ. Yeah, Give me a, perfect, I got yeah. a Tordal shot. Matt has you. gotten stitches in a bar from a PJ. <laughs> yeah, it helps. You know, I had a bullet taken out of my leg by a PJ. It's, it's, it's a good thing to have PJs. Awesome. So anyway, that's it, man. Dude. That's what I've been doing. That's my new mission. And uh, I hope people pick it up and like it. I love it, Dan. Thank you for stopping in. And please, my pleasure, brother. Go, good to see you. Go check Thanks, this everybody. book out, Alone at Dawn, about John Chapman, the combat controller that died in Operation Anaconda. Yep. A movie being made about him right now with Jake Jonal as the, as the lead. Man, this has been great. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me, man. Cheers, buddy. Awesome. See you. That concludes today's training. Any questions? 